This is what unboxing of the new Prusa MK4 3D printer might have looked like to someone. Unfortunately, not for me. Why? We will find out in this video. Before we start, I would like to say a few words. I bought this 3D printer kit myself with my own money. Nobody has any influence on the content of the video and nobody pays me for it. If you want to support my work, you can do so by subscribing here on YouTube, on my social media and by sharing my videos. Now let's unbox the kit of this 3D printer. First I have here a thank you note for buying the printer. At the bottom of this thank you note you can see the date when this kit was packaged. On the other side is a cheat sheet to help you identify some of the components during the build. Of course there is a pack of Haribo candies. And there is also a very nice manual for this 3D printer. There is also a USB flash drive with sample files and power cord. I also have here a satin print sheet that I bought with the printer. Now we come to the printer itself. I won't bother you watching me pull out one box after another. I will just add that the boxes are very clearly labeled and the overall packaging is really well designed. As a final item here I have the printer components testing protocol. After unpacking all the components it was time to build the printer. With the online version of the manual building the printer was very easy. In less than 7.5 hours the build was complete. At first glance the printer looks familiar but you can feel that a lot of changes have been made. We will discuss what the changes are and what components the printer contains in a moment. First you need to test the printer before using it for the first time by running the Joseph Wizard. When I started my printer I didn't have the option to change the printer language. In the current firmware version this option should already be available. At the beginning the functionality test of the individual components will be run. The funds are tested first. Then the z-axis will go higher and the auto calibration sensor will be tested. During the test the printer will ask you to push on the nozzle. This is followed by checking the x-axis, y-axis and finally the z-axis. Then the printer performs the nozzle and heated bed heat test. The nozzle heating test will also test the temperature change of the hot end heatsink. This is followed by calibration of the extruder gear alignment. Lastly, there is the filament sensor calibration. Why this is a calibration and not a sensor test is something I will cover in a moment. After getting the printer up and running, a Wi-Fi connection request popped up. After confirming the firmware in the Wi-Fi module was updated. After another confirmation it has generated a file on the connected USB drive. With the help of a computer I needed to insert the Wi-Fi credentials into the generated file. I then plugged the USB drive back into the printer and let the printer read the data from the file. The printer saved the parameters and successfully connected to the Wi-Fi. In Prusa Slicer, since version 2.7, there is an option to generate the file for the printer. You just need to enter the Wi-Fi name, password and select the disk where the file should be saved. We will discuss later what the internet connection is useful for with this printer. Compared to the MK3 version, there is a new 32-bit motherboard X-Body, which can really make the printer move and give it the much needed performance nowadays. The brain of the wall motherboard is the STM32F427 microcontroller which offers up to a respectable 180 MHz. The motherboard has plenty of safety features such as uh, hardware overheat detection, overcurrent protection and, and more. This motherboard allows you to connect to the internet using a LAN cable or using the provided Wi-Fi module. This module is hidden on the back of the printer. It is a simple ESP01S module with ESP8266 chip which supports only 2.4 GHz networks. 
There is also a USB-C connector, which is used for example to connect to a Raspberry Pi. Unfortunately, you can't plug a webcam into it. There are also several connectors on the motherboard that are definitely worth mentioning. One of them is the MMU3 connector. Another is this one labeled expansion, which is self-explanatory enough. Below that is a connector labeled debug, which is used by developers to debug and test the motherboard. Next, there is the ATEMP connector, which indicates that this could be a free slot for another thermometer. If this is true, this thermometer could be used for example to measure the temperature inside the enclosure. There is also a connector labeled I2C, which stands for serial bus. In theory, it is possible to connect, for example, expansion elements communicating on this bus in the future. And lastly, there is a connector labeled ADCELL, which slightly suggests that this is a connector for an external accelerometer. But these are all just my guesses and only time will tell where the truth lies. The frame has reinforced construction and visually looks very good. The Z-axis rods are now 10mm in diameter instead of the original 8mm. Also the printed parts are now significantly more robust, but the print quality is not breathtaking. The printed parts are still made of PETG and the parts around the nozzle are made of ASA. The X and Y axis motors have been replaced with the versions with twice the steps. Thanks to this, they are claimed to eliminate vertical artifacts in the print. Instead of the original monochrome display, there is this color display. On the right side is a USB connector for printing from a USB drive. While there is a touch layer on the display, the printer does not support touch controls. However, no one promised touch control, so we will save our tears for another part of this review. Below the screen is an RGB status panel that indicates the printer status by color. On the printer is new extruder, which is said to be a next generation extruder directly from Prusa Research. This extruder features a 10 to 1 planetary gearbox. The filament is pressed against the drive gear in two places, so there should be no filament slippage. The printer also has a filament sensor using a magnetic field sensor, aka Hall sensor. Theoretically, the printer could be able to detect fluctuation in filament diameter in the future. But again, this is just my guess. Thanks to the breakup board, replacing a damaged component is very simple. This is also related to the replacement of the entire hot end, where to replace it, just disconnect the connectors from the board and loosen the screws. The nozzle has now all metal filament path running from the next router, so there should be no filament jams anywhere along the way. To replace the nozzle, just unscrew the nozzle when cold and replace it with another one. The hot end heatsink has implemented a load cell sensor. This allows the printer to detect a collision between the nozzle and the print plate and determine the zero point of the Z axis by itself. The printer performs automatic calibration of the first layer just by this collision and only in the area where the printing will take place. Thanks to this, Prusa promises us a perfect first layer every time without the need for manual intervention. Thanks to the load sensor, the heatsink actually reacts to any effort to deform it. So the printer might be able to detect problems with the filament unwinding from the spool, for example. Also the printer might be able to detect a problem with the filament pushing into the nozzle, such as in the case of a clogged nozzle. Again, these are just my thoughts and ideas. This heatsink also has a thermometer that measures the heat transfer from the nozzle to the heatsink. This allows the printer to control the speed of the heatsink fan and therefore regulate the noise level of the printer. Interchangeable printing sheets are already standard on Prusa printers. The maximum print size is 250 to 210 to 220 mm. Compared to the Prusa MK3, we can print 10 mm higher. When the printer was announced for sale, it was stated that the printer has a technique called input shaper which is a technique to reduce resonances during motion. But as it turned out, that was a lie.
On September 18, 2023, a new final version of the firmware was released with the promised input shaper. At the time of this release, the printer had more than 100 print jobs and more than 350 print hours. Since the input shaper changes the printer's behavior during printing, it does not make sense to show prints printed on an older firmware version. And even though these prints looked really beautiful, a lot of filament was used and I spent a lot of hours printing them. Here I have a print that was printed on the original firmware. As a print profile, I chose 0.2mm quality. The print looks very good, but there are strong resonances. The larger and taller the print, the more visible the resonances are. A new G-code M74 has been added to the firmware, which can be used to set the print weight on the print bed. After setting the print weight using the command, the input shaper frequency for the y-axis is recalculated. Along with the new firmware came new print profiles for the process slicer. In addition to the two print profiles, there is also an edit G-code in the printer profile before each new layer. So during printing, the input shaper parameters are optimized based on the current print weight. For comparison, I printed the same model from the same filament with both profiles at a layer high of 0.2mm. The first profile was a speed profile. Compared to the print without input shaper, there is a significant reduction of visible resonances in the print. However, it seems to me that the print looks somehow smoother. It's as if all the sharp edges and details have disappeared from the print. The second profile was a structure profile. This profile is slower and is mainly used for printing functional parts. With this profile, sharpness started to return to the print, but also visible resonances. However, this is not a big deal. Compared to the print without input shaper, it's still a big step forward. With the speed profile, you have to take into account the occasionally inconsistent color of the print due to the changing time the filament is melted. This is most noticeable, especially with silk filaments where the surface gloss can be changed very significantly by changing the nozzle temperature and print speed. These prints can also be more fragile. The first prints are, of course, the ones prepared by the manufacturer. They are expected to show the qualities of the printer. The prints prepared on my USB drive were no longer relevant due to the new firmware version. So I downloaded their new versions from printables. I chose this rocket engine model as the first newly downloaded print. At first glance you can see that there is actually nothing to see. Adding black filament with glitters to the printer as a gift was a great marketing move. Unfortunately, a very poor choice from a review perspective. You certainly won't miss the stringing in the print when traveling between distant points. Due to the higher print speed, the resulting filament color is made, which makes imperfections in the print even less visible. Let me tell you straight up, this print is a damn good one. From what I can see, there is basically nothing to complain about. I chose this uh, Robo Apaka as my second newly downloaded print. I used a different filament to make the imperfections of the print more visible. Personally, I have to point out that this color looks really beautiful. Now you can already see the imperfections of the print. In most places, it is the standard uneven layering. The overhangs on the body of the Apaka look good. Input shaper works perfectly here. We don't see many resonances in this print. However, the same can be said for the details, which look smoother than they should. Here is a comparison with the variant from the black filament. As you can see, there are really not many visible details here. The third newly downloaded print was this spatula. Given its size, there is not much to talk about here. 
The print looks nice and the first layer looks really good. Everyone who purchases a Prus MK4 will receive a ready to print files for the Mini Sandy Boogie as a gift. However, the print files are for the firmware without input shaper. Still, let's take a look at them. This is a simplified model of Boogie number 11 from the Czech company 3D set. Instructions for printing and assembly can be found at this link. You will find this URL on the first and last print on the USB drive. The quality of the printed parts was very good. Or rather, the print quality was a little different from piece to piece. Sometimes better and sometimes significantly worse. In some prints, the resonances were more visible. However, these files were prepared for a printer without input shaper. I must point out, however, that I did not expect such significantly visible resonances in small prints. The uneven layering did not avoid these prints either. After almost 40 hours, everything needed to build this buggy was printed. Now all that was left was to put it all together. I have to admit that the assembled buggy looks really nice. The printer performs automatic calibration of the first layer by collision of the nozzle with the print surface. This allows you to print on basically any surface. Of course, it is best to print on one of the original flexible sheets. But nothing stops you from printing on a mirror, for example. Or on a print pad from another printer. Or on a piece from cardboard from one of my favorite filament brands. Or on a piece of paper that came with the printer. But there are two little catches. The first catch is that this print surface has to be all over the heated bed, even though the printer is only probing the area where it's going to print. In the original sample files, you could see that the printer was printing this cleaning line very close to the print. But if I create a file using Prusa Slicer, this line will be outside the print area. I can't tell why this is happening and support didn't know the exact reason either. The other catch is more of a kind of annoying feature of this type of calibration. The nozzle can press its imprint into some surfaces during the collision. If there is PLA in the nozzle, it can cause such spotting of the print surface. However, I do not find it necessary to consider this feature of the chosen calibration method as a problem. The print pad is a consumable that will wear out over time anyway with normal use. To avoid printing one model after another, I decided to print several models at once. I printed all the tests on a 0.2 structural print profile. Links to the used materials and the models shown in this video can be found in the video description. Here I have two benchy boats. <coughs> two benchy boats. One was facing towards the print cooling fan and the other facing away from it. Visually, I don't think there is any difference. Although the printer uses an input shaper, I don't think it did a perfect job. You can still see resonances in the print and not exactly small ones. However, the print was printed at a higher speed than on a printer without an input shaper. This would make some of the resonances forgivable. The top layers show insufficient amount of filament in some places. But in general, this is a very good print. With this boat I mainly wanted to test the cooling efficiency when printing a sharp overhang. As expected, the cooling, even at full speed, did not do the best job. But for such a sharp overhang, it is a very good result. The top layers on this print were already fine. The filament stringing is due to travel between several prints. Again, apart from a few imperfections, this is a damn good print. As another print, I had this wise here. Even from a distance you can see the same print quality as with previous prints. To screw it in, the printer needs to have good cooling and handle at least basic print tolerances. 
As you can see, the device is assembled and working. Plus, the print quality looks damn good. I'll check what the printer's real tolerances are on the next print. This model is my own model for tolerance test. As you can see, there is not a single cylinder left in the print. This means for us that the printer can handle tolerances of 0.1mm. Which is an absolutely excellent result. Let's take a look at the dimensions of the print. In the x-axis the print was 34.89mm and in the y-axis let's say 34.83mm, which is not very good. I'm not sure if these dimensions are due to the fact that uh, I built the printer myself or due to the already mentioned input shaper. To avoid saying that the tolerance test was this good only by luck, I decided to repeat this test. This time I spread the model over the print pad and used a different filament. I don't know about you, but I am very impressed. I have never had such a good result here before. The previous prints were printed from PLA. That's why I have now decided to print from PETG. I didn't expect any problems when printing from PETG. The only thing I expected was stringing with the wet filament. As you can also see in this print. However, this is nothing terrible that uh, the flame won't fix. The print quality was the same as when printing PLA. I almost don't print PETG as it doesn't give me any advantages. Still I decided to print a few useful things from it. Probably the biggest problem with most prints from PETG was the stringing and the cooling of the print. The print quality though remained the same. The description of the printer says that it can print ABS and ASA. To do this, the printer just needs to meet the nozzle and heated bed temperature requirements. However, in order to print successfully, a constant temperature must be maintained around the printer. This can be achieved, for example, by using an original Prusa Encloser or any other box. With the printer I purchased this print sheet with a satin powder coated PI finish. From the description, I got the impression that ABS, ASA and flexible materials would hold up better on it than on, for example, smooth PI. I first tried ABS. The model with the sharp corners was not the best choice. Even on such a small model you can see the problem with the adhesion of the print sheet. However, the print turned out as expected and the print sheet didn't show much either. I repeated the print, but this time I added a draft shield around the print. However, everything turned out almost identical. The print quality remained as good as with the PLA. At least as far as can be seen from this small print. I also tried printing from ASA filament. This material should be easier to print than ABS. Unfortunately, you can't expect miracles with a printer without controlled ambient temperature. To show the print quality of these materials, I decided to use Dimafix to increase the adhesion. The cube finished printing fine and as you can see the print quality remained as good as with PLA. TP printing is a nightmare for most mortals. I was hoping that this satin print sheet would make it easier to print. However, after a few minutes of printing I knew my expectations would not be met. The last thing I tried was printing TPU. Instead of a boring test, I went straight into a 5 hour long print for the cover for my phone. Due to the orientation of the print, a large portion of the print time was spent on printing the supports. But as you can see, the printer handled the printing very well indeed. I like that cover so much that I now use it instead of my original cover. Now it's time to test some printer features. The first test was on a filament change using G-code M600. The printer lifted the nozzle away from the print and parked it on the right side of the x-axis. It spit out some filament. It unloaded the filament and asked for confirmation that the filament was unloaded. The printer then asked for new filament. The filament sensor detects that uh, I inserted the filament into the extruder. Still, 
I was asked to confirm that I wanted to proceed and I pushed the filament into the extruder. Then the printer loaded the filament and spit out again. Unfortunately the spit was not sufficient and a second spit was needed. After confirming that the color was ok, printing continued as expected. As a second test I tried changing the filament using the menu. The whole process was identical to the previous filament change. Therefore I will go straight to the next test, which was the filament sensor test. Again the whole process was identical to the previous filament change. For some unknown reason, when the nozzle returned to the print, the filament change was triggered again. Therefore I repeated the filament sensor test. Now everything went fine. I then tried pausing the print. I wondered how the printer would handle the filament that was leaking from the nozzle. Unfortunately, the printer did not deal with this in any way. It just heated up the nozzle and continued printing. This was followed by a test of print recovery after a power failure. When the power was cut off, the nozzle was moved away from the printed object. After reconnecting the printer back to the mains, the printer resumed printing on its own. The printer then performed X-axis and Y-axis homing. The printer then heated up to the required temperature and continued printing. Again, the printer did not deal with the filament leaking from the nozzle. However, some print recovery after a power failure is still better than none. The Prusa MK3 was famous for being able to detect a collision with the print and redo the X and Y axis homing. I tried to see if the Prusa MK4 with input shaper could do this as well. But as you can see, the printer happily continues printing. There was no print collision detection. The Prusa MK3 did not allow printing to be resumed after the printer was switched off using the button on the power supply. I have good news for you. The Prusa MK4 has resumed printing during this test. The last thing was to stop the printer via the reset button on the display. After pressing it, the printer immediately stopped and terminated all jobs in progress. This of course includes our printing. Now it's time to evaluate the final print. The filament change using the M600 command and the menu was perfect. Both filament changes using the filament sensor also look perfect. In the print pause test, you can see that there was not enough filament in the nozzle at the beginning of the layer. The resume printing test after a power failure was even worse. During the nozzle heating, a large amount of filament leaked out, which the printer did not compensate for. However, no printer on the market that I know does it. Collision detection not working with the input shaper could not have turned it out any other way. The following print recovery after the power failure resumed the already messed up print very well. Before updating the firmware to the input shaper version, I ran a noise test on the printer. I tested the printer's noise level in a 12 square meters room in an ordinary prefabricated apartment. The printer was placed on a walnut wiener table a few centimeters from the wall. For the measurements, I used a Wallcraft SL100 noise meter with a frequency range of 31.5 Hz to 8 kHz set to measure sound at a DBA level that ranges from 30 to 130 dB. Measurements were taken from a distance of 1 meter from the printer while printing a file from the USB drive. The printer noise level was around 48 dB. I also performed the same test after updating the firmware to the version with the input shaper. The printer noise level went from 47 to 50 dB during printing with the 0.2mm structural profile. I also measured the noise level when printing on the 0.2mm speed profile. Here the noise was at a very similar level. So this is not a particularly noisy printer. However, it is still louder than the MK3 was. 
but the noise is a price for the higher speed. The printer itself is actually just an ordinary 3D printer. However, remote management can give you the feeling that the printer is something special. That being said, the printer has a network connection via a LAN cable and the included Wi-Fi module. If you are on the same network as your printer, you can connect to the Prusalink web interface. In this interface, you can start, pause and cancel printing. You can also browse, download and delete printer files. If you add your printer to Prusa Slicer, you get the ability to send a print job to the printer directly from the slicer. This interface is very limited, file upload is slow and overall there is nothing to see. Its big advantage is that it only works on a local network, so you keep all your data safe. Much more interesting is Prusa Connect, which is a cloud-based remote printing solution developed directly by Prusa Research. Once you have logged in and registered your printer to this service, you can control it from anywhere. As with Prusa Link, you have the ability to send a print job to the printer directly from Prusa Slicer. Through this interface, you also have the possibility to manage print files directly in the printer as with Prusa Link. But in addition, you get a print job queue, print history with repeat printing, the ability to control the printer and view various statistics. There is also support for the camera, for example using a mobile phone. Unfortunately, the lowest currently configurable interval is 1 frame per 10 seconds. That's not really enough to monitor the print status comfortably. However, this is a beta version of this service and so further improvements can be expected over time. I personally process all my print jobs on my MK4 only through Prusa Connect. Sending a print job directly from the slicer with the ability to check print status from the couch was more addictive than I expected. Unfortunately, quite often the file failed to upload to Prusa Connect. I was able to open Prusa Connect in the browser just fine. The printer was there and online, yet I was unable to upload the print to Prusa Connect. Let's summarize what I like about the printer. The big plus for me is the printer's appearance and its almost seamless operation. Offering to print the last uploaded file after inserting the flash drive into the USB, including preview and print information, is a little feature that still not many printers have. The same can be said about print recovery after a power failure. Replacing a damaged component on the print head has become significantly easier and faster thanks to the break board. Replacing the nozzle has also become very simple and is done with a cold nozzle and with the printer switched off. The automatic calibration of the first layer by collision of the nozzle with the print surface basically eliminates the manual adjustment of the high of the first layer. Printing elastic filament is now easy and significantly faster thanks to an extruder. Internet connectivity including an integrated web interface is also a big plus over other printers. The LED status bar is a nice addition and may come in handy for some. Lighting of the print area, at least from my perspective, would have been more useful. The ability to choose what information we want to see in the footer of the display is nice. It gives the user the ability to see the information that is needed at the time. The new part cooling fan can be pleasantly quiet and very powerful at the same time. When compared to the Plus MK3, a very significant improvement can be seen. The input shaper is a very desirable new feature and I'm very happy that the printer has received it. The G-code support for being able to set the actual print weight on the print bed is a unique feature that probably no other printer has today. In addition, the new firmware version will include the ability to exclude an object from the current print. So if some model gets damaged during printing, you now have the option not to continue printing in it. So there is no need to cancel the entire print and lose the models that were printed fine. The printer offers even more. Unfortunately, it is currently in a state where the hardware highly exceeds the capabilities of the current firmware. While the printer works great, not everything is always as perfect as it might seem. 
When the printer was launched, the promo video and website said that the printer has an input shaper, which later turned it out to be a lie. Check out the release date of the printer and the release date of the final firmware version with input shaper. As a person who bought the printer with my own money moments after its release, I see this as misleading advertising and it did not make me happy. Although the input shaper is present and actually very well implemented, it is still not clear to me how the resonance compensation will be handled with a different print pad. For example, a 4mm thick mirror will require different y-axis parameters than the original flexible sheet. The presence of an accelerometer on the heated bed could certainly help. But let's be realistic. I wouldn't expect Prusa to include a mirror among their print flexible plates. Loading the filament when there is no filament in the printer is completely hassle-free and super pleasant. The same goes for unloading the filament from the printer. But what I found incredibly annoying is changing the filament. The printer spits out the filament and unloads the filament. Even when I pull the filament out of the filament sensor and the printer itself shows me that there is no filament in the printer, I'm still asked to confirm that there is indeed no filament in the printer. After inserting the filament into the filament sensor, the printer again shows itself that it detects the filament. Yet I am asked to confirm that I have inserted the filament into the extruder and that I want to continue. The printer loads the filament all the way into the nozzle and spits out some of it. Unfortunately, that spit was never sufficient in my case and I had to spit a second and sometimes a third time. When printing faster, the components of the printer resonate and this increases the noise level of the printer. For example, the extruder breakout board cover really got on my nerves from time to time. Although the printer has a large number of supporting materials in its description, we need to keep our feet firmly on the ground. While the printer can print all of these materials, it can only print most of them by meeting their melting temperatures. You need to enclose the printer for a lot of filaments, especially for larger prints. The idea of printing an ABS print on an open printer on an entire heated bed is just ridiculous. While I really like the new nozzle design, there is one thing I don't like. I'm sure you have heard of the E3D Revo. Their system also allows for cold nozzle change and was even awaiting patent approval at the time the video was released. However, there is very little visual similarity between the two systems. The same cannot be said for the Duraplex nozzle for the Raptor hot end from the Czech company Protoprint. The new nozzle from Prusa Research is incredibly similar to the one from Protoprint. Protoprint has applications filled with the patent offices as of December 2020, where they are still awaiting approval and publication. If you want to upload your modified firmware to the printer, you will have to voluntarily damage the motherboard, which will avoid the warranty. Although Prusa keeps bragging that their printers are open source, this claim no longer puts a smile on faces as it used to. At the time of filming, it was impossible to get any documentation for the construction of the Prusa MK4 other than printed parts. A lot of the parts of the printer are so unique that building your own Prusa MK4 at home just loses its meaning. It's easier to build a Prusa MK3 in a bare frame and use a clipper as firmware. This will give you a 3D printer that has uh, even more power and skills than uh, what the MK4 currently offers. And with that, I could close this section. The printer works great, is reliable, and aside from the mentioned, I don't really have much to complain about. Except maybe the price, but we will look into that in a minute. As you can see, it's not the cheapest printer on the market, but I guess nobody counted on that. The difference between the assembled printer and the kit was almost the same at the time of filming as it was for the MMU3 upgrade. The MMU3 upgrade allows you to print up to 5 different filaments with the MK4. 
So instead of an assembled MK4, you can have an MK4 kit with the MMU3 upgrade, which is a much more reasonable choice, at least from my perspective. Speaking of the more reasonable choice, you need to look at the current competition on the market. You won't find many unenclosed Batslingers in this price range with the same dimensions. If we leave this price range, we get into the group of significantly cheaper home 3D printers. Almost any 3D printer design in the i3 style is capable of offering print quality like the MK4 at a fraction of the price. However, for many of them, you will need to print various upgrades and uh, give the printer some love. I mean, except for the Prusa MK3, but uh, it's probably clear to everyone that the MK4 offers more than its previous model. Currently, probably the most discussed competitors in the same price category are 3D printers from the Chinese company Bamboo Lab. For less than the price of the MK4 kit, you can have their P1P or P1S. The P1P and P1S are Core x 3 3D printers with very fast and high quality printing with a maximum size of 256 to 256 to 256 mm. The Bamboo Lab P1S is enclosed compared to the P1P and Prusa MK4. So it allows you to print materials that the P1P and MK4 without enclosure have no chance to print successfully. Like the MK4, the Bamboo Lab printers perform first layer calibration by colliding the nozzle with the print plate and have an input shaper. In the case of the Bamboo Lab, the input shaper includes an accelerometer and performs resonance measurements before each print. In addition, it offers print area, lighting and a camera to monitor the print via the mobile app or Bamboo Studio. The Bamboo Studio is a Prusa slicer on really a lot of steroids. For the price of the MK4 kit with the MMU3 upgrade, you can get the Bamboo Lab P1S including their AMS unit. You get a fully assembled enclosed 3D printer with the ability to print 4 different filaments. By combining 4 MS units, you can get printing from up to 16 different filaments. I personally own a Bamboo Lab X1C with 1 MS unit. The X1C also has a color touchscreen and LiDAR for automatic calibration of filament flow compensation. With AI, it can check the quality of the first layer and detect print failures. This feature pad combination costs almost as much as a built MK4 with the MMU3 upgrade. Plus, you won't find printed parts on any Bamboola printer. But there is one giant catch. Bamboo Lab's printers are closed system and Bamboo Lab generally makes a big effort to cover their work with patents, which makes their printers standard product that the market is full of. However, what may stop you from buying one is that Bamboo Lab also tries to patent things that someone else invented. However, as an ordinary user of their printers, and in fact uh, an end customer, this does not limit you in any way. Recently, more and more enclosed Core XY 3D printers are available. For example, the manufacturer Shidi recently launched their new XMAX 3 3D printer. The printer runs on an open source system called Clipper and also implements input shaper. The print area size is 325 to 325 to 315 mm and it also performs first layer calibration only at the print area. At the time of filming, the printer was cheaper than the assembled Prusa MK4. Another example of a cheap enclosed Core XY 3D printer could be the Creality K1. Although this printer was at a very tempting price at the time of filming, I personally would avoid it for the time being. After this release, the printer was rated as very faulty and problems were still with it even at the time of filming this video. If you want 3D printers with fully opened ecosystem in the same price range, you can look at Warren Design's printer kits, for example. However, Warren Design does not manufacture 3D printers but only creates their designs. Due to their popularity, kits of these printers can be purchased for very reasonable money. 
However, the printing of the parts, the assembly of the entire printer and the subsequent configuration is entirely in your hands. Of course, there are ways to make your job easier, but every shortcut costs money. I own Evoron 2.4 Revision 2 with dimensions 350 to 350 to 320 mm. With a lot of upgrades and printed parts, I purchase it for a price slightly higher than uh, what the assembled Prusa MK4 costs. Even though this gave me a large print area and a fully open system, I spent over 37 hours building the printer and setting up the basic configuration. The MK4 only took me around 7.5 hours to build. Here is a comparison of a few prints from the printers that I have on hand. For each printer I chose the slicer supplied print profile with a layer high of 0.2mm. I should add that the holes in the print is caused by a wet filament, not the printer. The first print is from a Prusa MK4 without input shaper on a 0.2 quality profile. I already showed you this print when I talked about input shaper. The print looks good, but you can see very strong resonances in it. The second print is also the Prusa MK4, but with input shaper on profile 0.2 speed. We have already seen this print today as well. Compared to the print without the input shaper, you can see a significant reduction in the visible resonances in the print. However, the print has lost details and is somehow smoother. The third print is the last print from Prusa MK4 with input shaper on profile 0.2 structure. We have already seen this one as well. With significantly slower movements, sharpness has started to return to the print, but also visible resonances. However, this is nothing terrible and compared to a print printed without input shaper, it is still a big step forward. The foreprint is from a Voron 2.4, built by me on a 0.2 standard profile from Orca Slicer. It may have been a few months since uh, the last tuning. Still, I think this print looks better than what Prus MK4 printed on their speed profile. The last, fifth print is from Bamboo Lab X1C on the 0.2 standard profile from Bamboo Studio. According to the table, you can see that the printer is not really afraid of speed. Even though the print is the fastest, I can say it's the best. However, considering the printing time, the final quality is really good. Feel free to let me know in the comments below the video which print you like the best. The review from All3DP says, despite 5 years of development, the printer seems a bit rushed. I have to agree with this statement, unfortunately. I visited Prusa Research in the second half of 2019. Josef Prusa personally showed me a prototype of the Prusa XL and the Prusa MK4. At that time, both printers still had a cycle gearbox as in the promo video for the Prusa XL. A few days after the Prusa Research visit, I printed a model of the cycle gearbox out of curiosity. However, more than 4 years have passed since then. More than 4 years and the printer looks almost identical to when I saw it in person back then. More than 4 years of development and the printer had various problems and shortcomings after release. It's clear to me that the company tried to do the best they could and that Covid didn't make it easy for them. Still, in 4 years of development, I think they can come up with something better than what the MK4 came up with. But as it turned out recently, Prusa Research spent that time working on all the printers. However, they are not part of this video. What to say in conclusion? Let's compare a Betzlinger 3D printer to a motorcycle and a Corex Y printer to a car, for example. They are both vehicles and they both get you where you need to go. A 3D printer of any design will still be a 3D printer and will perform the same task. If you buy a motorcycle, you buy it with the knowledge of what it offers and how it limits you. The idea that you are going to take a family of five, including a dog and a cat, on a motorcycle is as crazy as printing nylon on an unenclosed 3D printer. But if you decide to buy a motorcycle, 
You buy it because you want a motorcycle. You don't care that you can have a car for the same money. The Prusa MK4 is just such a motorcycle. While it is a very good 3D printer, it has its limitations and its flaws. With the components it contains, I already know that in time it will be an even better and smarter 3D printer than it is now. However, it's going to take a while and with the current happenings in the 3D printer market, the MK4 really isn't going to have it easy. But in general, buying electronics based on promises and expectations is not a good idea. If you like the MK4 and want to buy it, no one should stop you. The Prus MK4 is a really good, fast and basically well-made 3D printer. However, its release came a couple of years late. My Waron 2.4 or Bamboo Lab X1C seems like money better spent. Still, I decided to buy the MK4. However, it was primarily because of this video and out of curiosity about what Prusa research took so many years. It did, however, give me the opportunity to get to know this printer more and print on it almost daily. The printer worked flawlessly and with each firmware update the printer got smarter. If I had to decide what to invest my money in, I would unfortunately avoid the MK4. Let me know in the comments below the video what you think of the printer and if buying it makes sense for you.